Hello and welcome to Six Figure Authors, the show that helps you take your writing career to the next level. I'm Lindsay Baroker and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Joe Lalo. And I'm Andrea Pearson. And the three of us have all been publishing for more than 10 years and full-time authors for a lot of those years. So today we thought we'd share some of our top tips or at least tips that we came up with that seemed important <laughs> that we've learned over the years. Before we jump into that, do you guys have any news you'd like to share? I do. I do. Pick me. <laughs> um, yeah. So I finished writing the second book in my series and it, the last few weeks have been really, really not fun. I've been having some health issues again, but um, I was lamenting to Joe and Lindsay about that. I'm going to be cutting my hair shortly here. Um, I emailed my newsletter list for the first time in six months, almost six months. And I don't remember if I mentioned that last time or not, but um, I was like, I, I decided, I, I don't know, I'm kind of like one of those blunt upfront people, you know, I'm very open about how I'm doing things. And so I told them, you know, one of the reasons I burned out on fantasy was because my most recent series didn't do super well. And so I explained how I felt about that and uh, not how I felt. I didn't go into emotions or anything like that. I was just like, it just made it hard for me to feel like I should finish a series when nobody's bought it. And then I decided that I was going to be like, you know, I'm going to do something I've never done before and I didn't want to do it, but I was like, I, I set up an anonym, anonymous form and I was like, is there any reason why you did not download and go ahead and put it here. I won't know who said it. Like the number one thing people said was COVID. And so there, you know, some people didn't even know I had a new series out. So I did get a bunch of downloads on that series, but most everybody said the people who filled it out said that they lost their jobs or their main source of income or something happened where, or they didn't necessarily lose their work or their job or their income, but they were so distracted and so stressed that they couldn't read. And so I, I had several hundred people respond and I'm like, okay, so I don't, I'm going to stop stressing about that series. I'm not going to do anything with fantasy until I, I am, until I feel like there is a desire there for readers. And then also I'm, I'm just enjoying writing the other genre that I've been doing. So uh, launching a new series under a new pen name has been interesting and challenging, uh, challenging because it's not easy getting reviews when no one knows who you are. And you listeners, you guys all know that. Um, uh, and interesting because it's been a long time since I was a new author and I'm learning a lot. Uh, I released the first book uh, about a week and a half ago and I have about eight reviews. I haven't been hitting it very hard because like I said, health problems, and I'm just going slow and easy on this because it's the first book and I don't have the second book ready yet. So I don't want to push too hard just yet. Um, it's the book is downloading every day though. It's actually down downloading better than my fantasy series are books are. So that's encouraging. Um, but anyway, so I'm just going to see how things go and then hope for the best and expect the worst <laughs> no <laughs> the end uh as for me uh not too much has changed since last week uh things are proceeding of pace at the epic fantasy sequel I, i'm working on the second one now and i'm i don't know fifty-two thousand words in so uh it's definitely going to be you know closer to the target length than the first one was which is nice i solved that problem but uh, also, I've been having a tremendous amount of difficulty finding a, uh, an artist. I, one of the books that I've decided to release that I was sort of debating on just doing as a Patreon thing, uh, I want to have Pixel Artist do the, do the cover because it's got like video game elements, and I think that would work for the target audience. And uh, boy, oh boy, is it hard to find a Pixel Artist who uh, works at the level of, of detail that I'm looking for and is still doing it because I don't know if it was a plague or something, but in 2018, so many pixel artists just stopped posting their art. <laughs> it's like, and, and like I found six or seven ones that are like, oh, this portfolio is fantastic. They even do book covers, fantastic. And then they just haven't been active since, uh, since 2018. Uh, so, and also, by the way, apparently, uh, most of them are from Poland. Uh, that was just a strange little correlation I found as well. But yeah, so that book release is going to be later than I had expected, because I didn't expect to spend almost two months looking for an artist and still not find one. Uh, but that's fine. It wasn't technically part of my, my release schedule yet, because again, I was sort of planning it on just being a Patreon thing. Um, and my other artist is actually working on my epic fantasy covers. Otherwise, I would have just had him do this too. Eventually, I would have given up on the style I was looking for. So things are, have been slowed down, probably. Again, I would suspect COVID is, is, uh, is to blame in terms of people, A, having too much work because so many people are trying to publish books at this time, or B, uh, you know, having to give up on a, a side job because they had trouble with the main job. You know? Either way, uh, 
Other than that, I'm, everything's proceeding well. I'm very happy with my consistency with my word counts, which is something that I often struggle with. I wonder if uh, some of that is, I actually was listening to an interview with a business person who was saying all of his businesses that he's an investor in have had to pivot online. So all of a sudden there's like this huge demand for copywriters, artists that can do, you know, kind of stuff for the brand, for the business. So I don't know how many people are looking for fantasy art that <laughs> might be sucking up your people, but apparently it's a pretty good time to be in that business. Andrea, are you sharing your... Uh, genre of your secret pen name i didn't even know that you had published your first one i'm not not yet <laughs> because i'm i'm watching the algorithms you know i'm like trying to be careful because oh no just I... just the genre or are you hiding oh, that too it's it's gonna be romance i mean it's always either fantasy or romance <laughs> that's where my interest goes <laughs> yeah i i put my pre-order up i think i mentioned that last week for my epic fantasy and i also put a pre-order up for the a space opera at the same time this sort of a it's not anything anybody's waiting for but i've noticed from the pre-orders i was like okay i think more people want epic fantasy than want space opera i don't know why I, you know sometimes it's like why do you write this other genre but you know you kind of love them both you, well i it's actually one of the things i'm going to talk about later so i guess i'll hold off on that for my news. Um, so I've been uploading audiobooks through Find Away Voices for a while. I do ACX too. I'm just non-exclusive with these, uh, the last two series I've did. But I did my first audiobook production with them to find a new narrator to do a backlist series. I, I have a narrator that I work with a lot all the time uh, when I produce my own, but it's a female narrator and this particular series is all from the male character's point of view. So I thought I should get a guy. And I will say, you know, pretty good experience overall. It was, I tried, I'd like done it a couple of years ago and, you know, kind of looked for voices and they only gave me a couple, a couple of years ago. And I was super underwhelmed with them at that time. This is probably 2018. Like they were both kind of new people and I wasn't <laughs> that crazy about them. But this time, you know, I think they gave me like maybe like 10 or 15 to listen to. And they were, there were a lot of people with a lot of credits and I found somebody I really liked. He did a good job. He did everything on time. Good final product. I'm planning to do, there's three more in the series that I'll ask him to do. The only cons I would say a little bit was that um, I've gotten used to working outside of the system. Uh, I, even though I met my last narrator through ACX, we've kind of just, as soon as I just st stopped going exclusive with ACX, we just started working outside of the system. And so like when I send her errors, all I do is send the Word document with comments. And like, this was at 12, 17 in chapter five, I had to upload the errors to, uh, to find a way voices by chapter. Like I can just put a document with everything in it. So fortunately there weren't a ton of errors. So that wasn't that big of a deal, but that was a little slower. And in the end, uh, oh, also, they, they only gave a 10 day turnaround for me to proof the audiobook, which I wasn't sure if that was like 10 days or 10 business days. And I thought that was quite fast to get. It was a 10 hour audiobook proofed. And I don't do that myself. I pay other people to do that. So that was like, I had to pay a little extra to get a rush job for that because usually. I don't know, more like three weeks is kind of what we've done. Um, but I don't know, maybe that's just the industry standard. But I felt like, I was like, wow, I just got to, there it is. And I got to get it back to them uh, pretty quickly. Lastly, I got a pile of FLAC files. <laughs> I was like, what are these? I have to convert them to MP3 so I can now upload them to ACX and BookFunnel and from my YouTube stuff. I wish I could have just given me the option of choosing, do you want FLAC files, which I had never even seen any seen before or do you want mp3s because i would have picked mp3s because i was like i still it's been a week and i like still haven't i'm sure it's easy it's like a free software will do it but i was sort of like well that wouldn't have been my first choice uh so that was a bit odd but i i would say it's a good way to find people either acx or find away voices whatever you're most interested in um but then after doing a couple you may want to like kind of move out of the system and just work directly with the people if it's possible it's kind of like 99 designs if you've ever done that where they deliberately do not give you the contact information of the artist and everything is done through their dashboard because they i'm sure they get a cut <laughs> i mean you know uh, and understandable they they helped me find an artist so i do appreciate that but you know after like i said after a while you may want to just like because i think that when i w left acx as far as doing it that way my narrator took off like 25 dollars per finished hour so that kind of told me like that might be how much of a cut they were taking so there's a tip i guess if, if that works for you guys do you have any thoughts on that before we jump into the topic 
Nobody <laughs> has thoughts. Both unmuted at the same or you both time. have thoughts. I was just going to say, I'd never heard of Flack either. So I was like, uh. <laughs> uh Flack is a lossless uh, codec. So it's like for audio files. Uh, and yeah, there's tons of stuff. You can just, it's, you could just basically play, make a playlist and hit convert. Like it's not hard to find a way to, to fix that. I will say that I, I'm, I'm the same way. I have also like discovered uh, narrators through ACX and then done independently with those same narrators. And it, uh, I do kind of like the process separately better than through ACX. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree. Like I, the discovery, as, as we just dis mentioned, how finding an artist can sometimes be very difficult. Uh, so when there's a discovery tool, it's it's handy, but it's also handy to be working directly afterward. Yeah, in this industry, whether it's cover artists or narrators, if you find somebody good that is reliable, <laughs> you know, keep them, pay them well, give them bonuses at Christmas, because it, it's really hard to find uh, good people. So. You should consider yourself blessed when you find someone. Um, okay, so before we jump into our tips, why don't we just kind of remind everybody or any new listeners, what are, summarize for each of us, kind of like what our tenure path has been at short summaries. <laughs> I guess we don't have to go into our full bios here, but kind of how we got to like full-time authors. Yeah, it's funny. Every time I tell this story, it gets shorter. <laughs> but uh, I wrote a gigantic book through most of high school and, and college, uh, almost half a million words, and that became the Book of Deacon trilogy. I broke it, broke it up into three 140,000 roughly word books. Um, and uh, when I was in college, I had typed it up and revised it and all stuff and, and, and made it into three relatively clean self-edited books. Uh, and then I spent several years, uh, almost, oh, heck, I spent at least five, four years uh, trying to get an agent using these books and, and failing. And then my friends, can, you know, after my soul was thoroughly crushed by the entire traditional, uh, you know, onslaught, my friends who had convinced me to try that uh, convinced me instead to do self-publishing. So I released the first book, The Book of Deacon, with a homemade cover and self-edited via all of the usual places, Smashwords and, and Amazon. And I made $19 that year. Uh, and then I, I ended up putting out the rest of the books and I made the first one free because of uh, an article I'd read about uh, and, and by Brian S. Pratt, who had done similarly. And that worked out really well. Pixel of Ink picked it up and I got thousands of downloads in, in, in just a few days. And that sold through to uh, the other books in the series. I earned about 3000 bucks and I used that money to get uh, covers. And I got five times as many sales on those books after I got those covers. I used the money I got from those sales to uh, uh, get edits and start, you know, considering this to be a career moving forward. And I was doing pretty well. Um, by 2013, my income from the books was considerably more than my day job. And by 2014, I was offered a, a, a promotion on my day job that would have been a much more demanding job. It would have basically doubled the number of hours I had to work, which would have completely eliminated my capacity to write. So I had to make a decision at that time if I wanted to be a writer or an IT guy, and I chose writer. And uh, for several years, I was a mid to a low to mid six figure author, uh, hence the title of the show. Uh, in recent years, I've dipped a little bit, but it continues to be my only source of income. And uh, it doesn't seem like that's gonna be changing anytime soon. So yeah, that's where I, that's, that's how everything went for me. It's so awesome. I love hearing these kinds of stories, <laughs> um, except I didn't talk too much about, well, I'll just, okay, I'll tell my 10 plus, and I didn't go so much into what anybody, anyway, <laughs> English is not my friend right now. Okay. All right. So I didn't want to, I didn't grow up wanting to be an author or a writer or anything like that. I didn't start writing until 2008. Um, and I wrote the key of Kalenia um, six weeks, worked on it for you know a year and a half. And then I got an agent in 2009 and he got me a whole bunch of, con like not a whole bunch. He got me a couple contracts. One of them was with the publishers of Twilight. And then he was, had a bid war going on with, um, a couple of movie studios to auction off the rights to, you know, to make a movie out of that because he had, that's where his background was. He was, he was more in Hollywood than he was in the literary world. Anyway, um, I ended up turning down all of that and signed with a small press publisher made him really angry angry understandable understandably but he he um he was okay with what i wanted and he worked with us with that publisher for a little while until he was like this publisher's not going anywhere and so he he signed out he left the the deal whatever and then i 
took me a little bit while longer because I was so starstruck. I'm like, I've got a publisher. Um, that I, it took me a little while to, to catch on to what he'd seen. And then, so I left on my birthday in 2011, asked for my rights back. And because it was a small press publisher, it was really easy to get them back. And I self-published um, that year, early that year. And it's been a rocky, but really wonderful experience. Rocky because I didn't know what I was doing for the first few years. And I wasn't just learning how to publish and market. I was learning how to write because I had never done creative writing before that. And um, yeah, we've been discussing our success a lot lately. Uh, we've worked really, really hard. We started off in hard genres to market, and then we made a whole lot of marketing mistakes in the writing itself. I've discussed that in the podcast before, like having my main character be 14 instead of 12 or 16 and another main character being 18. And it just, it made it so that readers don't, there's no solid age group and readers disagree on what age group the books are targeted towards so it's just and I've missed other things too but um, I did I did learn a whole ton about how to run a book business and I I was able to just by learning how to smart market I was able to get us up to six figures uh, that was pretty exciting uh, that lasted for a little while and then it wasn't until our two-year-old uh, I till I got pregnant with our two-year-old that my income started dipping and that was that's it's going up now again which is exciting but um it was pretty difficult for a couple of years though. I kind of, I just took a break from writing. Um, anyway, like I said, I floundered a lot in the beginning. There wasn't a whole lot of people back then who, you know, could be like, Hey, you know, there was no 20 books to 50 K group. There was no, there weren't Facebook groups for indie authors. I don't think I didn't, I couldn't find any when I first started, maybe you guys saw some, but anyway, so it took a while for me to figure out what my goals and ideas of success were. Now it's all changed. I, I have different ideas of what success is now. Right now, since I have three little kids that I homeschool, my business is successful if I'm earning more than I'm spending. And if I'm able to teach and help others, um, most months I earn way more than I need to keep the business afloat. And so I, I consider the business successful, even though I'm not currently a six figure author, but, um, I, I think that's one of the things I, a lot of indie authors, they, you know, they always say, you got to figure out what your idea of success is. I think most authors, okay. Every author I've talked to their idea of success is monetary success, but I think there's also, there needs to be a, a peace and a happiness that comes. Like if you're killing yourself to write, to make that monetary success, you're not going to be happy, even if you're making a lot of money. So I think it's just, it's going to be individual and then hopefully lots of money too. <laughs> I wasn't even on Facebook when I got started. I had a Twitter account. I was using the stock agents because that was the thing you did. But uh, yeah, I don't even know if there were groups. So uh, there was keyboards. I found that early on. And there were a couple of people blogging about stuff. But um, so for myself, I had been working. I had had a bunch of health stuff going on. So I got out of the army, went back to school. By the time I finished school, I was like, ah, I had all this RSI pain in my hands and, and, and just all sorts of issues that were not uh, making it conducive to like finding a nine to five job after school. So I was kind of trying to figure out how to work from home full time. And I, that was about the time Google AdSense came out. I started making websites, getting affiliate income and AdSense revenue and figured out how to eventually build that stuff up. and was doing that full time by the time I graduated. Um, so that was time, that was my job for about five, six years. That was a full time income. And it's funny now because I look back, I wasn't really writing about stuff I loved. I was vaguely interested. I read a lot of home improvement stuff. I've always been like that HGTV, oh, House Hunters, new episode of Hunters International. Uh, the, that person, although I haven't kept up, they're on season 587 now, I believe. <laughs> I don't know, that's probably true though. But um, it wasn't a passion, but at the same time, I got to the point where I was only working like maybe three hours a day at that. And the rest of the time, I don't even know what I did. I did hiking with the dogs. Um, I was in a writer's workshop because that was my first passion. I always did love books. I was an only child, read tons of books as a kid and wanted to be a writer, but it was very discouraged, even though my parents were super supportive. My dad was very much like, you should get a degree in business or computer science, I think is this new thing that's coming on strong. And so I just always thought, no, nobody makes a full time you know, can make a living as a writer, especially doing like fantasy and, and science fiction that seemed really hard. But um, so I was off and on in a workshop for quite a while. I'd finally got in. So I had like two novels finished and I was completely dreading the whole look for agents and try to find a, a publisher. It sounded like a slog, really slow and time consuming. And honestly, when I started looking up agents, none of them wanted what I was writing. I was just writing this kind of like fun, bantery, swords and sorcery or sword and steam or something like that kind of story, my first series. 
and they were all they were like we don't want that at all or just nobody mentioned it they're like we don't want anything like derivative of tolkien or dungeons and dragons or anything like that and i was like but i love that stuff um but so i was querying but not, not much was happening uh, i got my first kindle about that time this was late 2010 j.a conrath i found him he was posting his earnings from self-publishing and i still remember a post he did where he's like yeah i made a hundred thousand last month and i was like what that's amazing uh he did have like 80 books and a lot of backlist stuff from traditional publishers and here i am with two novels they weren't even like in a series but you know i was like oh maybe i can make a little bit let's give this a try and within a week i, I pivoted it was just full-on self-publishing uh, published my first two novels, basically to crickets. <laughs> it was the first thing that started moving the dial, and I've talked about this before, was doing a short story, and, and I, knew, I knew how to make it free at Smashwords and Barnes and Noble. Did not know how to make it free at Amazon at the time, but um, it, it happened to tie into my my series. It, it showed the the two characters doing a uh, I don't know solving a crime or something together, and at the end I put a little excerpt for the book and I made that story free and I got a good cover for it. I, at the time, the guy was in India. I we didn't communicate that well, but he was a good artist. I got a cover for like two hundred dollars for that, which uh, was actually pretty good, pretty sizable money at the time because this was like right after the big what do we call it, the global financial crisis or housing meltdown and everything. So my regular income had taken a pretty big hit. All the home improvement stuff was suddenly not doing as well. So that was pretty good money. Uh, made it free and finally started selling books. And by the time I had my third novel written in that series, I had figured out how to make a book perma-free also on Amazon, the price matching thing, not just on Barnes and Noble. So I started selling on Amazon too at that time. And that was the definitely when you know, I started having months of like a couple thousand dollars. And by the time I finished that series, which was, I think, seven novels, and I'd written a couple novellas and a side thing at the, at the same time, I was making enough that that could be my full time income. And that was like 2012, I think, and have not looked back since then. I think the I remember feeling like, wow, I've really made it when I, I paid more in taxes than I used to make full time in the army, which actually was not that much money. Right now, I would be delighted to pay only that much in taxes, but um, <laughs> that's a good problem to have, so no complaints there. All right, do you guys have any more of that kind of stuff, or should we just move right into the tips only 20 minutes into the show? <laughs> I can say that uh, I, I realized I was doing well when my entire day job income went to paying my taxes on my on my books that year. <laughs> that was the year before I quit. Yeah. Well, I think you have the first tip too, Joe. Do you want to take sure. us into it? So yeah, my first tip is uh, you should be keeping track of your successes as well as your failures. It's pretty common wisdom that if you're doing poorly, you should assess your situation and figure out why you're doing poorly. But the same holds true for success. If you're doing well, but your success is coming primarily from sources outside of your control, it's a sign that you need to start working on your career to ensure that it's a little bit more reliable and stable. For example, early in my career, having a free series starter was a profoundly efficient way to funnel readers into a series. Uh, but the bulk of those readers were, were discovering the free books uh, because there was an incentive at the time for blogs to advertise free books. The, the way the Amazon affiliate system worked, you could make a huge amount of money because every purchase that somebody made after going on that free link, you made you know, your affiliate income from. So blogs would just do all the work for you. They would just search for free books and, and, and you know, talk about them all the time. So buckets of free, free advertising. And then Amazon changed the affiliate policies and, uh, you know, all of a sudden free stuff stopped being quite so easy to, to, to push. And if I had, if my success had completely depended upon other people at the time, and it did at the beginning, uh, and then that change happened, it would have pulled the rug out from under me and I would have collapsed. So the fact that I realized that I could not choose to make one of these things happen, I had to sort of hope that they happened. Uh, I sort of assessed that and started trying to widen my stance and, and uh, uh, it worked out well. Or, organic sales are great, but if you are not the organism that is driving those organic sales, then you're at risk and you should consider experimenting with other tactics and, and you know, adding, say, advertising or other stuff to, to the mix. Yeah, should, I wish we each talk about each other's point a little bit before moving on, maybe a little bit. Um, I think that's a good point. And also the fact that 
I, I usually tell people kind of related to this, don't quit your day job on your first series because you may have accidentally done something brilliant or just really kind of hit the what the people want. Or like Joe was saying, like early on, you know, maybe you got plugged on one of the big sites and that gave you a big boost. And you, it takes a couple months usually before things start to tail off. Well, maybe not as long anymore, but it seems like we used to get longer tails on things like a book bub or something like that. Although they didn't uh, exist either till like maybe 2013 or something. Um, but yeah, just keep track of it. Make sure you figure out what happened so you can try to replicate it if you can. But I would wait until you're kind of, you know, we talked about this, I think, on the Joe Solari show, until you're making a good income, even when nothing is going on and you're not releasing a new book that month uh, before quitting the day job. Do you have any thoughts on that, Andrea, before I do mine? Yeah, um, I was going to say, like, keeping track of, like, if you're running promotions with different websites, keeping track of which ones fail and which ones succeed is also really beneficial. Just, I mean, it's... If, if you run a huge, big promotion with all of the websites, everything, you know, you just trying to get everything as much as you can in it's, it's too hard to tell where you're putting your money and what's actually going to bring you in um, downloads and things like that. If you are not keeping track and I suggest people usually space things out by two or three days, just so that there's no overlap between different promotional websites. And the same thing with like Amazon ads versus Facebook ads, don't test them out at the same time, test them out separately. All right, for my tip, it is to, and I have to remind myself of these things basically every year, but, you know, write the books, the stories you're excited and passionate about, and then figure out the marketing side. I'm really glad that with my first series, I didn't know anything about marketing. I didn't know anything about like, I, there wouldn't really be a good category for me on Amazon. I was just writing the, the stuff I really loved. And so I've done a lot of series at this point and I've definitely felt the urge as I've learned more about like, oh, wow, that's the stuff that really sells to, to kind of try to nudge what I like to write closer to what is selling in the genres I'm in. And this has really worked well for me. I think if you can successfully write to market, you know, to do it, you can do it, but to do it, you really need to like put your ego aside and kind of be all in with writing what's selling. And you probably need to be someone who really enjoys the popular things in your genres. Maybe that's not entirely true, but I know for myself that um, it's never really worked well for me when I've tried to like do what I really love to do, but also, oh, this is what's selling. So let me try to eh, kind of put it there and fit it in somehow. Um, but on the flip side, the ones that my fans have enjoyed the most, uh, the books and series that have made readers into fans have been the ones that are more different than similar to the, the trendy stuff. And I think that's because I get the kind of people who are more like me and looking for and not finding the books that they want to read. So, you know, if I write stories like others are writing, there are other people already doing those kind of stories and honestly doing them better. But when I write something unique and that's really for me, I get the however many people there are that... Um, you know, are kind of looking for that sort of thing. And those readers tend to be really loyal, you know, if you do a good job giving them this, the type of story they want, because there aren't a lot of other ones like you out there. So that's, you know, it, it's not as easy for marketing, but um, when you are done, that's when you can kind of figure out how to best sell it. The further you wait, the farther you are away from what's popular with people, the harder you have to sell, harder you have to work to sell books. So, you know, but you can kind of find the things that are in your book and that are also you see in a lot of like maybe top 100 books in the genre you're kind of closest to and play up those elements. You can't trick people into buying something they don't want to buy. But if you see assassins, you know, epic fantasy, you see assassins coming up a lot and you have an assassin, maybe mention, highlight the assassin in your blurb and put him on the cover. If that seems like it could work. Um, but what you'll find is that, and I didn't realize this in the beginning, even though people are looking for sometimes if yours is different and they're looking for something different, it's a good match. You tend to get more readers and more shots if you make it seem, make your blurb and cover art and everything kind of look like what's selling. People sometimes don't even know they want something different until they try it. And first you have to like show them that this is like something else they already liked. But um, yeah, that's, do you have any thoughts on that guys? Uh, yeah, I think this is like super important. Like we talk so much about how, you know, the market is so uh, important, but you still have to produce a book that people are going to like. And the book that you're most passionate about is the book that's going to be the most unique to you. And particularly if you're trying to make a career, you're going to be trying to build, you know, a, a voice that people are going to keep coming back to. 
So uh, even more important than having a successful series is having a successful style that people will follow through in multiple series. And that's not going to happen if you're just trying to emulate someone else. So uh, it can be really hard if it turns out the stuff you're passionate about is really oddball and niche, but uh, chances are your book is going to be easier for you to write. And uh, once you do get an audience, those audience will, will, will develop a taste for everything you write because this is closer to your, to your genuine voice. So uh, what stuck out to me a lot was you, you mentioned ego, like put your ego aside. Um, it's, it's true. I mean, especially, I don't know, it, authors have like two halves, a very egotistical half and a very humble half where like my work is crap and then my work is great. Everybody's going to buy it. And when it comes to writing what you think is going to sell and what you think and what you're passionate about, it, it is, it's important. Like if you're going to write to market, you do need to put your ego aside and recognize that maybe you don't know what the readers expect in a book. Um, maybe you can't just go, hey, I really enjoy this genre. Maybe you need to actually analyze why that, that genre is, you know, why people, what people like about those genres. Um, but also like writing what you're passionate about also means pacing yourself well so you aren't pushing super hard where all the joy in life goes away. And this is me, like the last two years of my life what was me pushing really, really hard to get that mosaic chron the midnight chronicles out. And I don't know if you guys remember, like my life was going really great. And so I set up pre-orders for all of the books in the series. And then my life fell apart after I'd written the first two books. And I couldn't have predicted that. I couldn't have predicted, you know, my toddler having problems, things like that. But uh, I ended up pushing really, really hard. And I still enjoyed writing the midnight chronicles, but I was working so hard to get them done that the joy of writing left. Uh, and so I, I don't know, like, I think it's important to have a well-rounded life, you know, where you are doing other things outside of writing, um, you know, pets, kids, friends, I, I, just things that take you away from your writing occasionally so that you can maintain that passion and that excitement about books. Uh, and then that way, like readers can tell, I mean, if you're passionate about what you're writing, readers can tell, like Lindsay was saying, so. All right, so I've got the next tip. Um, it says, do your, it says, my tip says, <laughs> my tip is uh, do your best to keep quiet about your business plans until you've been able to stick to one thing for a long time. And this is geared more to people who are like, ooh, shiny, ooh, shiny, you know? Um, I see a lot of authors proclaim that they're going to do something and they try it out for a couple of weeks or a couple months and then they switch to something else entirely and then they try that out for a little while and then they switch again. Um, this includes how you run your review team, what sort of launches you'll do if you're going to release wider in Kindle Unlimited and how long you stay there, um, what your goals are. So like how many reviews you want, how many downloads, how many readers, it's in like the notoriety if, you, if you're aiming for notoriety and all of that stuff and anything else that can be changed as part of your business plan. I'm not saying you shouldn't flip flop because we all, we're all going to do that. And we all, I mean, even after we've been doing it for a little while, we're still trying to figure things out. Right. Um, I'm saying don't be super public about it until you're going to stay where you're at for a long time. So don't get on Facebook and be like, or don't email your list and be like, um, so my readers who post reviews, you have to post a review or you get kicked off. And then like two weeks later go, uh, never mind, We're not going to do that. Uh, just work out things, work, oops, work out all the kinks until you are where you want to stay and you're happy with where you are. And the reason for that is because, uh, if you stick to something for only a, for a very short time, even if it's like three months, that feels like a really long time to you, but to readers, to somebody who's on the outside, it it feels like it happened practically overnight and people naturally distrust those who are flaky and sadly, honestly, changing your business plan a lot makes you come across as flaky. This applies to introverts, introverts as well as extroverts. I see a lot of author, authors proclaim their business plans and then they change those business plans shortly thereafter. And um, so, yeah, basically make sure you've got the kinks worked out of your system before you commit publicly to something. And that's just kind of a really, really random tip. Um, it's just me working with clients, just you know, I made those mistakes when I first started out in the very, very beginning. And then I've got, you know, we, I know about half our listeners are newer authors and then the clients that I've been working with, I'm just, you know, get those kinks out. Don't, don't proclaim publicly. <laughs> well, I will say I have done that a lot and I still make that mistake where I, I'm excited about a new idea. Like whenever uh, Brandon Sanderson did his Kickstarter, I was like, I'm totally doing a Kickstarter of what I'm, you know, I'm going to do a new installment in my first series. And I mentioned it to the fans and they were like super excited. And have I done that yet? 
no. Do I even want to particularly do it? I mean, yes, but not this year. I should have just kept my mouth shut. And I've learned that too, not to put dates on like when the next book is coming out in a series, unless I'm really sure that I'm like, if I'm working on another series at the same time, maybe I don't want to like promise that this will be out fall of 2020. Cause I've done that before too, where I, I let a series put it on the back burner because it didn't sell as well as I'd hoped. And I started working on something else. And it was several years before I got back to that series and people would be like, hey, you said this was coming in the fall. And I'm like, dang, is that still in the back of the book? And I deleted it from the back of the book, but still that doesn't delete it from the copies that were already downloaded. So these days I'm like, I almost never put a pre-order up until I've at least written the first draft, unless I'm really, really confident that um, I'm going to be able to get back to that. And well, putting a pre-order up does make it a little more real, but I try not to tell the reader something is coming unless I'm quite sure <laughs> that something is coming. Usually it's better just be like, oh, surprise, new series, here you go. Uh, pass it to Joe. And, and really fast, um, <laughs> actually, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, this, this applies to listeners because I, pro I was working on that course for um, dictating and I got my bug to write right when I started working on the course. And I was like, I'm taking advantage of writing. So those of you who are waiting for the dictating course, it's on the back burner because I'm writing now. So I, I publicly proclaimed on the podcast that I was working on a course and then I never finished it. So there you have it. <laughs> yeah. And another thing with this, especially when you're like early on in a new business plan, uh, early results of a business plan aren't always, you know, what the results will be consistently. Very frequently, any new tactic, uh, whether it's just something you're trying to do or something that is an advertising something or anything, really, frequently novelty will cause an uptick in whatever. Like you'll be more productive because you were trying to be more productive or you know, it's the first time you ever run an ad like that and the ad is super successful. So you got to figure out what the steady state is. Again, it's just Larry thing. You sort of got to figure out how things are, uh, uh, you know, how things will be once they've evened out. And you can't really, you know, early on, you don't know that. So announcing too quickly can be a problem. All right, so my next step here, uh, uh, tip here is, many small hoses fill the bucket fast, uh, which basically is try to maximize the number of income sources you have. And it, it might sound like this is a weird version of uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket, but it's a little different from that. I like to have a fairly wide stance on the market, which it's taken the form of ensuring I keep most of my books wide instead of exclusive, but this adage that I this tip here is can easily increase your income and sources even if you're Amazon exclusive because you got to remember paperbacks audiobooks translations print on demand merchandise if something doesn't take a lot of ongoing effort to maintain setting it up as a passive income is pretty much always worth it if there's not a giant outlay of, of initial cost or if there is but you're re reasonably certain it'll pay for itself in the long run then just set these things up and have them running in the background and even if they're not all big earners if you have a ton of them then all of those little trickles start to add up and depending on your skills and your motivation some of the higher maintenance things like a patreon or a youtube channel or a twitch channel or direct merchandise sales they can help too and often a lot of these have a much bigger punch but that's because they require a lot more effort uh, and of course, you know, going wide is another example of this, where you you go from having just your Amazon income, which might be a lot bigger, uh, to having a lot of smaller incomes that hopefully will overall even out into a little bit more of a steady stream. Uh, and not only do these multiple income sources mean that you're less reliant on a single storefront or a tactic, it also gives you additional lottery tickets that could pay off. Like if something suddenly a trend hits and people really, really want to buy enamel pins and it just so happens, well, I set up a store with some enamel pins a while ago. Well, what do you know? And now you're sitting on top of that that plan. It's likewise with, you know, you make a, a, a storefront suddenly might take off or uh, anything like that. Like just having income from a bunch of different sources means that any one of those sources could suddenly start earning more than the rest. And uh, if you had never dipped your toe in there, at the very least, you would be scrambling to get into it. Uh, at the very worst, you'd never even know that that was a, a business potential. So you'd be surprised at how quickly the tiny little drops in the bucket uh, start becoming a really reliable amount of money over, over uh, the long term. Yeah, I agree with that. And something that, I mean, like you were saying, the, the passive income stuff is always worth it in the long, in the long run. Uh, I would recommend that you put those things together that only need to be done once. You don't need to do ever again do those first before you like try out other things. So for example, if you don't have your books in print yet, don't 
try tackling Patreon or YouTube or whatever. Um, so, so focus on those things that are our first uh, do once and then earn forever type items. The smaller sources of income definitely can add up. Like I've always been, even before I started launching series exclusive with Amazon, it was like 80% of my income. So I was like, I'm always happy to get money from other places too. Anybody that wants to send me money, I'm happy to take your money. <laughs> but it wasn't like I really worried. Or even, I mean, I think there was, I remember this because Brian Cohen called me on the Sell More Book Show where like I had not gotten paid by Google Play like a year and a half or something. And I was like, let me go check on that. And I had like $28,000 in there. I was like, oh, I think I ended up buying my Jeep with some of that money. But it was just like the fact that I wasn't checking on it that much, but it, there, it does add up, you know, if you're making, if you're wide, of course, if you're making a little bit every month on the other sides and you're running promos to all of them, uh, you, your income will hopefully increase over time. And some of the things like Joe was saying can sort of come in, come into the spotlight almost accidentally or with just a little nudge and it's hard to predict what that will be just this last year for me practically you know more like the last six months audiobooks have come on pretty strong for me a mix of me doing the youtube stuff and then podium my publisher for those has been um getting more like uh, audible started doing some subscription like if you remember you get more free ones to download i'm not sure exactly what it is even though i i am a member <laughs> i do i get i'm like sometimes something's free but um so auto, you know, that's just it's, I'm still paying exactly much as as much as I always was to produce them. But now that I'm building up more of an audiobook fan base, I'm starting to make more on the new releases of audiobooks. Even though I'm not exclusive anymore with Audible for um, for the ones I'm producing myself. So it is certainly don't want to snub anything, especially when it's things where it's like a do once and then it's for sale and it can continue to bring in money in the future. All right, my next tip is to, and this is not necessarily for your first book or even your first couple where you're really kind of, maybe you're in a workshop or, or, you know, you're going back and forth with the netter, you're really learning the ropes. That's, I think you should not rush that. But eventually after you've written a couple of novels, I think it's useful to work on your process to become faster and more efficient not at the expense of quality, but just kind of realizing what you're doing that may be slowing you down and that you could be doing more, especially if you do have the goal of some time, you know, doing this full time and replacing it, it becoming your day job. You don't have to write a book a month, but in this day and age, it's, it's a challenge to make it on a book a year. There are some people that can, and they're kind of the anomalies. Um, but there are perks besides money that are perks to publishing more quickly, you know, besides the money. And those are, First off, you, you get more series out there and that gives you a chance to try new subgenres and other genres that you're excited about to see what works best for you. For a lot of authors, it's the second or third thing that they try where they really take off. I've seen that over and over and over again. So keep that in mind if your first thing is not doing as well as you'd hoped. Uh, also, if you publish more quickly and get more books out there, you have more data points. So it's a lot easier to see what's working and what's not. Like I've learned that my books with the, that are more YA, you know, like 18 year old heroes or heroines don't do that well with my regular readers. And they're not usually on point enough or on trope enough to catch a lot of new readers of YA fantasy and sci-fi. So if I choose to do a younger character, I, I have to realize that <laughs> it could be a challenge. Um, also, when you build up a larger backlist, eventually you have quite a few complete series. So you can alternate what you're marketing, you know, like maybe what you're focusing on, what you're running up, maybe one's perma free book one, another series you're going to have in KU. And, you know, the more things you have to kind of cycle through, the less people are going to, because you, you know, you kind of feel that after a while, if you're advertising the same book one for over a year, that just doesn't seem to perform as well. But if you give it a rest for a while and you've got something else you can advertise, then, then you can come back later and things will kind of pick up again. So uh, the, the more stuff out too, the, the less steep of a dip or a drop off in income you often have between new releases. So along that line, <laughs> these are some of the things I've done over the years to become more efficient. I used to write first drafts longhand, <laughs> really. And I have horrible writing, so uh, just trying to read it and transfer it uh, was a difficult, but basically you're rewriting the whole novel as you type it in. So that's pretty slow, uh, taking some extra time. 
I also used to print out my manuscripts to make editing notes on the page. I'd, I'd like read in bed and just make notes on the paper. And then, but then I'd have to transfer everything back to the computer. So again, it's not that this is a horrible thing or is bad or I didn't like it. I did obviously, but it, it wasn't as efficient as just editing, to, you know, and now I work full time on my laptop so I can drag it around the house if I don't want to be stuck at my desk. Also, I used to edit chapters as I went, as I wrote them. And I find it for me, different things work for different people, but for me, I found it was much more efficient to write the whole novel, then go back and edit it. Because chances were I was gonna need to change things that I didn't realize until the end of the book, like, oh yeah, I gotta add some stuff back in the beginning, or, or maybe I didn't need that thing I thought I needed. So why waste time editing something and making the sentences pretty and clean and tight when you're in, gonna end up going back and rewriting it or cutting that scene anyway? Uh, also, I was a pantser uh, for pretty much the, most of my first series and everything before that that I never finished, <laughs> um, which that works fine for some people again, but I, for me, I found out I stopped wasting as much time on rewrites and I, I didn't get stuck. Uh, when I, you know, when I pantsed things, I kind of tended to get characters stuck in a spot. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm not quite sure how to get them to the ending or out of this situation. Uh, but when I started outlining ahead of time, it allowed me to see like, oh, that, that's a problem. I got to fix that. And yeah, so that's how it's going to go before I started actually sitting down to write. Also, I've learned, <laughs> even though this doesn't always go to plan still, but in general, I know to order the cover art and book my beta readers and editors ahead of time, often before I even start a new series. And, um, you know, I'm kind of like a little factory now <laughs> when, the, when I send something off to the beta readers, like right now I'm editing book two in my epic fantasy and I've told my beta readers, okay, a little over a week, this is going to be coming to you guys and they'll have it for about two weeks. It's pretty long. <laughs> I think it ended up like 183,000 words or something. Um, but I'm, while they have that, I'll be starting on the next thing. And then when it goes off to my editor, I'll be further working on the next thing. So it, it's just kind of a, a cycle. Uh, the last thing that I you know, was my tip for how to become more efficient. It was just learning to get inspired by other people. Um, so you can either be depressed or envious of people who are doing more, producing more, or just doing better than you are, or you can let it motivate you. Uh, so when I started hearing about other authors writing like six, 7,000 words a day, and then Rachel Aaron came out with her 2K to 10K book, I was like, wow. I think at the time I was writing like 3,000 words a day and I'd just gone full time. So I thought that's pretty good. But just the fact that other people were doing way more made me start to want to think, you know, I could probably do more too. And, you know, it's like you don't want to, there's a fine line between making yourself burn out. You don't want to do that. You want to figure out kind of what you can consistently do over time. But, you know, it's, it's anybody who plays sports, you know, it's like this competition actually makes you better. So it's, even if you don't see your fellow writers as competition and it's just inspiration, there's probably a little competitive part of you that's like, oh man, if she's got all those kids and she can do it, you know, and all I've got is dogs, I can definitely do that many words a day. All right. Do you guys have any thoughts on any of that? Um, I will say uh, like one of the other like benefits of just getting faster and more efficient is that you, and producing more output as a result is that uh, you're, getting more practice. There are illustrators like to say that every artist has got 10,000 bad lines in them. And the sooner you get them out, the better you start drawing good stuff. And it's the same thing with with words, except it's a lot more words. Like I'm going to say probably most of us have got several million bad words in us. <laughs> and if we, the better we, uh, you know, the sooner we get them out and the more practice we get at writing, just you're going to get better overall. So I feel like improving your, your efficiency and increasing your output means that better output over over time like your quality will increase just by practice yeah i agree with that and then another thing that came to my mind while listening to Lindsay talking about how to you know get more efficient over the years when you're in the revision process don't leave anything for your future self to work over so if you know there's a problem with this the story you're, and you're like okay i'll get back to this in the next round don't do that don't let yourself do that um if you fix problems this run through because that trains you to have cleaner revisions, getting you to a polished product much faster. And it also helps you learn faster because I mean, it, it'll take you like weeks possibly to get to that spot again and it, just make yourself do the work now. Am I next? <laughs> I, don't know, oh, yep. I was just wondering, am I supposed to talk again? I, no, no, I think Andrea is next. <laughs> Okay. So don't be worried or scared or whatever to try something new. So I'm talking like, 
like switching out book covers, prices, and descriptions. All of that stuff can be changed uh, very, very easily compared to the old days. And I'm, this is something I hear all the time, like, but things are going okay right now. What, what happens if I change a cover? Well, um, the worst that'll happen is it'll tank your sales, but with how volatile things are in the market, if you don't test and figure out why something is working and what is working, you won't learn for future growth and success and your sales might tank anyway. You don't know. So, you know, so it's better to make your mistakes early on in the game to try things out, figure out which covers, which descriptions, what prices, et cetera, work best for you and for your readers before a lot of people know who you are. Um, honestly, I think we frequently worry too much over things that won't matter a couple of days later or weeks or even months down the road. And our goal is to be authors for the rest of our lives, not just now. So do what you can now to make the rest of your life be successful. That's sort of the first thing I recommend to people when they're like, my sales are awful, you know, and like, well, let me look at your cover and blurb and, <laughs> you know, look inside. And uh, oftentimes it's, it's very frequent to be like, mm, this is probably the problem or part of the problem. So it's, and those are pretty easy things to change. Cover art may cost you money, but you can just try the first cover in a series. You don't have to worry about them not matching and then kind of see, and I know Andrea's talked about this before, like running split tests, like with Facebook ads, like figuring out which cover is more effective. Uh, and that's actually gonna sell more books, but you know, uh, it's it's okay to change things. And I agree, uh, you know, the only time you might not wanna do it, like I've got one book that always way outperforms all my other box sets. I'm like, I don't touch that one. Like it's a, like, on, even the cover design, yeah, the cover designers have been like, hey, do you want us to redo that series? Cause they're kind of old and dated. I'm like, nope, <laughs> but um, I may eventually one day, but uh, it's just been such a, for whatever reason, that blurb and that, that cover have worked really well. So I've been hesitant to change it. Um, but yeah, if things are not going well, that is a perfect time to change it up and see if those little things may make a big difference. Yeah, uh, people often, I feel, a lot of people feel like, well, once the book is out, that's it. Like, they sort of forget they can even change something about the book. And I've made some pretty sweeping changes. As I said, I I uh, changed the cover after I got my first batch of money, and then I re-edited it and put it back up after a second batch. Like, you can improve stuff and you know, see the results. And it's not just in terms of sales. It'll be in terms of, like, you know, review score. Like, you'd be amazed that you can, if you can add a full star to your review store, score, if it was self-edited and then went to a professional edit so yeah D don't be afraid to, to, to try new things uh, so my next tip uh, my last tip actually is um, build networks not just with other authors but in related fields just try to build wide networks and I am a terrible networker I, I mentioned on a recent show that I went to Book Expo America and sort of didn't realize that people go there to meet other authors and publishers and stuff so I was just treating it like you know oh I'm gonna go to all of these stalls and look at the publisher stuff but I have gotten better as the years went on. And I try to be a friendly kind of person and I experiment with a lot of stuff with other artists and other writers. And it's given me a lot of points of contact in a lot of different areas. And sometimes these have led to inclusion in like group promos, which have worked out very well for me because, oh, Joe's, Joe seemed like he was a pretty nice guy to work with and he's got a book in this field. Uh, sometimes they've gotten me in on the ground floor of things like Story Bundle, and I was in the very first Story Bundle, and I was in several since then. In fact, it ran. I ran to the problem where I had to stop being in Story Bundles because everything that I'd ever produced eventually ended up in a Story Bundle. I just didn't have anything else to contribute when people asked. Um, sometimes it gets you involved in a webcomic, which, you know... Uh, I have done and sometimes it gets you hired as a freelance writer for an ad campaign, which I also have done. Like if you reach out and you have a big enough network, you'd be amazed at the opportunities that start coming your way. Uh, I've been in invited to contribute to Kickstarter anthologies and, and, and got paid for my work. And those anthologies turned out to be award winners and got me some of my biggest accolades. And this was just because I had worked with some of these people in other instances and they were looking for somebody who they knew to be amicable and skillful and competent to fill in a slot. So you'd be surprised, again, you can build a lot of bridges uh, over the course of a few years if you're, you know, it, you don't even have to be adventurous. You just have to be pleasant and competent. Uh, and this isn't, isn't to say, by the way, that you should be blowing up people's email, uh, uh, asking everyone you know, to, hey, don't forget about me, because that really will turn more people off than turn them on uh, to, your, to your, you know, usefulness. Uh, it also doesn't mean you should be saying yes to every opportunity because uh, you can quickly become swamped and, and you need to learn to sort of assess opportunities for their value. 
it can be difficult, particularly if you've done a really good job at, at, at networking. Uh, but you're going to, because you'll be getting a lot of offers and you'll get a lot of just a lot of communication. It'll be difficult to develop that understanding of how to best invest your time. But the project that could save your career or make your next year's income double what the previous year's income was can come from some pretty unexpected places. And I can count at least three separate years when uh, my income was hugely benefited by just some oddball project that somebody recommended. So, you know, keep those doors open. So, um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. Some of the best opportunities I've ever had have become because of networking. And um, it's, yeah, yeah. There's just a lot of opportunities that happen because of networking. And, and honestly, a lot of the time, your success doesn't take off until you have a group of like-minded authors who work with you and um, invite you to participate in things with them. Uh, also, don't forget the value of paying it forward. Networking is especially beneficial if you're helping other people out well before you ask them to help you out. So don't, like Joe said, don't be like emailing random people and asking for help, you know, nurture and, and build relationships and see if they're actually going to be able to help you before you ask them to help you. Like, random family members and friends probably aren't going to be able to benefit you too much when it comes to finding new readers as much as an author who has books similar to yours and who gets along well with you or whatever you have a relationship with who could share with their readers. I will say somebody who is quite horrible at networking absolutely hates it does not want to do it will not go up and talk to a stranger at anything even if a stranger is somebody like a, a rep from one of the stores it would actually be useful to know in lieu of that try podcasting or having a blog or a youtube channel because then you know if you're able to successfully do it you'll become known in your you know your area what well, you know we're authors i guess so that's our area and the same kinds of opportunities will come your way people will think of you just because they know you and you probably weren't putting in only a you know let's say an hour or two a week is not an only, but compare that to actually being really active on a whole bunch of Facebook groups or, you know, maintaining email relationships with a lot of people. Uh, you know, that stuff's really time consuming too. So if you are the anti-networker, you know, I'm sitting here by myself in my room. Yes, I'm talking to Joe and Andrea, but this is something an introvert can do. Uh, I will say it's kind of awkward doing it by yourself. I Like I started a couple podcasts that I only made it like seven episodes because it's just too weird sitting there recording something, talking to yourself. But it, you know, it may suit you more than you think it does. And I've had, uh, as, you know, as far as opportunities, I was blogging about self-publishing in the beginning. There weren't that many people doing it. And when BookBub came on the scene out of nowhere, like I said, it's probably like 2013. I remember they ran my book, The Emperor's Edge. And I, I had no idea who they were. And I was like, what the heck? I just got like a bazillion downloads of my book that, you know, usually gets whatever 20 a day or something and somebody reached out and like hey we saw you uh blog about self-publishing we ran your book you know hey if you want to mention book pub and i totally did a write-up about it because i was doing that stuff more before i switched to podcasting but uh you will find that if you're kind of out there as a content provider kind of trying to help people that you know it comes back and you do get some opportunities so there is that Alrighty, my last tip is that if you're not someone who loves writing to market and you sneer at that kind of thing, um, you should probably, but you wanna be a full-time author and you wanna make good income from this, you should at least consider doing kind of a mix of projects so that maybe some of your passion projects and you know from your heart, they're probably like, maybe they'll win awards or, you know, maybe they'll be completely unique, but they're probably not gonna sell piles. Maybe consider doing a mix of those and then a mix of more commercial books um, I am a little lucky in that the stuff I like to write isn't super esoteric, but I'm also not, as I talked about, someone who's ever been tapped into popular culture or aware of what's in the zeitgeist. Like, I have to look at Google. What were the Google trends for last year? Let me, let me find out. Oh, okay. I have no idea about that thing. I don't know who that is. Don't know what that is. Um, so I even, not only that, but I tend to kind of actively hate a lot of the popular tropes. And I was like, ew, ew, why, why would why people read that? I don't understand. Um, but so one of the reasons I started writing is because I actually, you know, when I was younger, I would read anything, but as I got older, I got pickier and I couldn't find exactly what I wanted to read. So I started to write the kind of stories I wanted to read. And, but over time I've gotten sort of a feel and by time, I mean, lots of books released, lots of series, writing in a couple different genres, several sub genres of sci-fi and fantasy. 
I've gotten a feel for what of the things I'm willing to write and interested in writing is more likely to sell and what isn't. Sometimes I just have to write something because it's calling to me. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I just wrote a spin-off novel with a character that didn't exist at all in the main series. And the main series didn't even sell hugely well to start with. It, you know, it's done fine. It's been like a fan favorite, but it has it's never been easy to advertise <laughs> the, the first book. I think people read the description like, hmm. And I've even, uh, I, as we were talking about, I'm like, I should really write a more space opera-y description, but the problem is I didn't really write a traditional space opera story, so that's tough. But um, it sounded fun to me, so I had to do it. But um, as another, you know, to hold it up to that, I'm also put up, you know, I just put a pre-order up for that, and then I put a pre-order up for the book one in the epic fantasy series. And it's like, I put them up only a day apart, and it's like, oh, epic fantasy, getting a lot more pre-orders, go figure, than um, my fun little space adventure thing where they don't actually go to space until two thirds of the way through the book. But um, so I know for me that the epic fantasy kind of sells better than my space opera, but I do like to do both. And I, you know, my urban fantasy series that I tried last year, that did pretty well. It was um, pretty, it was easier to advertise. It seemed to fit, even though I've been told like, it's not very typical, <laughs> surprise, surprise of what is, popular right now in indie urban fantasy but um uh it, it did work pretty well sold pretty well worked with advertising so i'm going to write a spinoff of that series next year because they were not only they sold pretty well but they were first person so they were pretty sh they were short compared to my other stuff and pretty easy to write so i know i mean i don't know for sure that that's going to sell but probably it's going to be a lot easier for me to to work on than like the epic fantasy that's twice as long uh each book so the point is that for most of us, if you want to be a career author, you may have to do a mix of things you love and the things that you're going to really pay the bills that maybe aren't quite as exciting, but hopefully you don't get yourself into a situation where you're writing something that you hate. Uh, you know, like I've certainly come across people that, you know, that, that are writing like erotica and they're super tired of it or they never liked it to start with and they only tried it because they heard it brought in a lot of money. And then it did bring in a lot of money. So they felt stuck doing that, even though it wasn't what they were passionate about. So, you know, you, the more you publish, the more you'll kind of figure out what are the things you love doing work well and which ones don't work as well hopefully you get fans over time that will read anything you write which is awesome you know that's like the the best thing you can have as a writer uh, if your first series just kills it and everything's golden then great you don't have to worry about this but uh, for the rest of us you may have to do a mix of uh, passion projects and, and more commercial stuff uh, I've definitely done some stuff that would not be considered commercial. And uh, frankly, if you do this frequently enough where you, you just throw in an oddball thing that's just for you, uh, you start to develop a, a reputation where people sort of look forward to the next weird thing. So I'm not going to say that it's enough to make those financial successes, but it, it, it suddenly becomes sort of a fun thing that you have with your fans. It's like they're sort of like they're part of an inside group because, oh, oh, he's doing one of these weird things. Oh, I wonder what it's going to be this time. So, you know, you can have fun with the stuff that you know isn't going to sell. Yeah, um, the whole commercially commercial vi commercially viable, that's pretty much happened with the Midnight Chronicles. So my my true fans, the true readers that were the ones who, you know, my diehard fans, they're the ones that gave me their anonymous, anonymous opinion. But the thousands of readers who didn't fill out that survey, there was still a reason why when that book was presented to them, they chose not to download. And that was on me, honestly. It doesn't have a lot of commercial pill. 85% um, of my readers are female and I wrote a series about a guy and I missed a bunch of different tropes in this urban fantasy series that um, I'd hit really well in previous series. So I think, um, and passion project, I don't know. Like I, I'm kind of to the point where I don't have a whole lot of passion. <laughs> like I'm excited about works and excited about books, but I also want the time I, that I spend writing to give me money. <laughs> so me, I'm, I'm grabby. I'm all, you know, ABBA, gimme, gimme, gimme money. Um, no, that's a guy after midnight. Never mind. Totally wrong song. <laughs> but I'm, I want to write something that people want to read and I can generally find, I, I, I pick stuff that I'm excited about because I don't know, like I can't write what I'm not excited about. I just, I can't. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to see if I can, you know, gear what I want to write around what the readers want and what the readers expect. So, yeah. So um, if you have to write something, you know, go back and forth maybe between the passion projects and the commercial projects, but I don't know. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs>
Okay. I'm going to go on with my own tip because English. Yeah. Guys, this, this last month or so I was listening back on our episodes and I was like, man, I've really been struggling lately with English. Um, hopefully we'll get that out of my system here soon though. Uh, along with the theme of what Joe mentioned in his last tip, you don't have to do everything and you don't have to be everything and you don't have to try everything. Being a master of all trades isn't really honestly a compliment um, to those who focus in and narrow in on one thing. People like me who are masters of all trades flit around from subject to subject and they they lack the ability to focus their energy and to become truly excellent at one thing. I'm a master of all trades and my husband, Nolan, picks something and he focuses on it and he's gotten really good. And he's kind of helped me. Like, I'm like, Ooh, look, that sounds so great. We should try that. He's like, like when lit RPG was a thing, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to write lit RPG. And Nolan's like, no, I don't think it fits you. I don't think you'd be happy writing. I'm like, no, you can't tell me what I can and can't write. I'm going to become a billionaire and write lit RPG. And I wouldn't have finished a book in lit RPG. So Nolan was like level-headed about it. I mean, he didn't tell me I couldn't do it. He was just like, I don't think it's, it's something like, he's like, you're going to have to really learn how to write lit RPG. And the things that the people in that audience want, I don't care about. So they want stats on the uniform, I mean, this the armor and like the swords and the weapons and things like that. And I'm like, I don't care about that stuff. So I wasn't even giving them something that they wanted. And so um, if you're wanting to be an author, consider doing things. So the way I've done things is I like to try everything out at least once. And just to kind of see, you know, I'm like, Ooh, that sounds like something fun. So it's, it's okay if you do that. Um, and if you're excited about a new project and, and, and then you, you try it and then decide if it's something that you want to do again, that's fine. But if it's not something you want to do again, then pass it along to someone who is passionate about, oh, sneeze, <laughs> who, is, who is passionate about it. So if you, if you do tend to flit around, ask yourself the following question, how willing would I be to do that for the rest of my life? Or, um, how would you feel basically doing that one thing for the rest of forever and, and not doing anything else? If the answer is, I don't really want to do that, then hire or contract it out. And, um, and like I said, you can try it once and see how it goes, but you do not have to be doing everything all the time. You don't have to be everything or be everyone. Um, and so for example, I hate formatting print books. I hate uploading to retailers, retailers. I hate updating back matter in my books. I enjoy, but I don't love scheduling promotions and newsletter swaps. So I have my assistant do a lot of these things almost all the time. So I usually format my books because it takes me like three minutes and I usually up to load to retailers and I've come up with a system for my back matter where I'm only updating about once a year, but I have my assistant do the other stuff because I don't have to do it. I don't have to personally do it. Um, on the flip side, I love doing book covers. And when I handed that off to somebody else, I kind of felt like a part of me was missing. Like I, it, it just, I don't know. It was really, really weird. It's something I could do for the rest of my life and be perfectly content with. I mean, I do love writing. Obviously I love writing. I'm, I, I do writing more than I do book covers, but if I couldn't ever write again, I would love to continue doing book covers. And so I'm back to doing my own again for my new series and I've created some new ones and I'm swapping some old book covers out and I, I enjoy it enough to not have a problem with me doing it myself and same with writing. Um, other things I'm not nearly as passionate about being able to hand off those things and relinqu relinquish that control. It frees up so much time and not just time, but brain space and energy. And if you have a crazy life, that is necessary. That is so important. And I've said this before on the podcast, but sometimes you have to like branch out before you feel super secure financially to find the help to get you the free things up so that you can afford to per, you know, progress in your business. Um, anyway, so in that same vein, just because someone said it worked for them doesn't mean it'll work for you. If FOMO, so the, you know, the fear of missing out is the only reason you're wanting to do something, don't do it. So that was me with Patreon. I was like, oh my gosh, some of these authors, oh my gosh, Lindsay and Joe, I'm going to put it on you guys because this was back on the old show. I was like, Lindsay and Joe have Patreons. I need to have a Patreon. And so I started it. And guys, that fear of missing out was the worst business decision, not the worst, but it was a bad business decision for me. So don't base your business on fear of missing out. If it won't benefit your business plan, it'll end up causing problems later down the road. And if it will benefit your business, but you won't have the necessary time to devote to it until it becomes that benefit, it'll cause problems later on. So just say no to shiny side projects and marketing tactics until you know they'll work or you know you'll have the necessary time to devote to them to get them to work. And that includes Facebook and Amazon ads and all that. Yeah, it's funny as we're recording this um, and people 
get this a week after we record it, but Kindle, KDP Select just yesterday in the dashboard was like, hey, cereals, Kindle, I think it's Kindle Vela. Do you want to try this? It's like, oh, I have like 2,000 words in the story I started that I'm like, wait a minute, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, I need to focus on this epic fantasy series, which is like a known thing that will make money versus what is this with tokens? And uh, yeah, I don't know, I could try it. Maybe I'd get new readers that I didn't have before. But um, I shut that down after <laughs> only a couple hours. Um, and, you know, maybe it'll be a good opportunity for someone like if you don't already have a proven thing that's earning money, like you don't already know you're more going to make more money or, you know, be more successful or whatever you're trying to do, doing the thing that is already working for you. If you don't have a thing that's already working for you, maybe it's worth trying. Um, but not if it's like you're in the middle of a novel and <laughs> you don't go like, oh, I should start a serial now. Like that's the worst thing. And that was like 20 years, however long I was writing uh, as a hobby you know off and on um, that was my thing I always started things and then got like the 40,000 words in and something else was more fun or it stopped being fun so I went off to something else so watch out for the shiny object syndrome and and I don't think any of us actually brought it up in our tips but kind of the 80 20 rule too we've talked about it before figuring out which things that you do actually result in book sales and which things are just becoming a time sink and really not like maybe a patreon if you only got three subscribers is not the best use of your time especially if you've committed to like writing new fiction for it every time and you know unless it's something you love to do anyway and you're going to repackage those and sell them there's nothing wrong with that but you know, I like I thought a long time before starting a YouTube channel because I knew that would be a, a time sink, although I'm very half assed at it. So it's not really that much of a time sink. And I was actually relieved when I found out the audiobooks did way better than me recording videos because that's a lot of effort, like record the video and edit the video and come up with a stupid little thumbnail for the video. Whereas uh, just doing the audiobook it, that's already produced is pretty easy. So yeah, I definitely uh, agree that you kind of half of like learning how to do this at a successful career and not burning out and everything is just figuring out which things actually move the dial and that you enjoy doing enough so it's not super onerous and if you don't you can uh, possibly put some of them off on an assistant <laughs> yeah and i will say that uh, sometimes you will if you find that there's a lot of friction to doing a task uh, unless that task is absolutely necessary uh, then you can just sort of find something to replace it because if you can find three things that go very quickly for you and, and are more fun for you and you can put those out uh, to replace the one thing that was a real grind but had decent output, even if it ends up being more work, if it's just less friction and, and less frustration, you're going to enjoy it more. So don't feel obligated to do absolutely everything that, that everyone says if you find yourself putting way more just frustration into it than you, good you're getting out of it. All right, we've been blabbing for an hour and I think we're about done. So does anybody have any final thoughts before we sign off? No, nope. tipped out. No <laughs> final thoughts, no final tips. All right, well, thank you for listening everyone. And thank you to Joshua Pearson for producing the show. You can find the show notes or leave a comment or question at sixfigureauthors.com with the number six. Facebook group, Six Figure Authors. I just approved one person and denied five people that to not answer the question. I love that question, you guys. It keeps randos that don't listen to the podcast from getting into the group. <laughs> All right. Thank you to everyone who's answered and it's in there. And big thanks to everyone that participates because I only, I've just been so buried in this epic fantasy that I'm like in there maybe once a week. So I really appreciate uh, how helpful everyone is and that you take time to answer each other's comments and questions in there. All right. Enough blabbing. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. See y'all later. So long, everybody. <laughs>